be afraid. Be very afraid. Be very, 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 very afraid. It's showtime. Welcome to Video Scaries, a series where we look at the various bits and pieces of video that scared us senseless as kids, and we'll see if they can still scare us now all these years later. And for this episode we're going back to the 1970s, a time where the threat of nuclear war was a serious prospect, and how we all learned to protect and survive. <laughs> At the tail end of the Second World War, in 1945, two atomic bombs were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. This was the first time a weapon of this kind was ever utilised, and it proved how devastating this new technology was. With the establishment of the Cold War soon after, nuclear tensions began between the world's superpowers, and it was at an ever-present high. With the near miss of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, it almost seemed then like nuclear war could well be an eventuality. Both across the US and the UK, various information films were produced to educate people as to what they should do in the event of a nuclear attack. And that's what we'll be looking at, the series of UK films that were published in the 70s, Protect and Survive. Now this series of videos takes itself very seriously, no messing around here. There is around 20 episodes and I won't show them all as we'd be here forever. So I've selected some of the episodes which I think best highlight this series and just how terrifying it is to re-watch it and put yourself back in that mindset. It's not necessarily with what it presents, but it's terrifying because, as I say, it's an insight into the minds of our defence back then. How real the threat could have been. So let's kick things off with our first one of the day, Nuclear Explosions Explained. Nuclear explosions are caused by weapons such as H-bombs or atom bombs. They are like ordinary explosions, only many times more powerful. They cause great heat and blast. They also make a cloud of deadly dust which falls slowly to the ground. This is what is called fallout. So these are the two dangers. First, heat and blast, which is followed by fallout. The heat and blast is so severe that it can kill and can destroy buildings for up to five miles from the explosion. Fallout is dust that is sucked up from the ground by the explosion. It can be deadly dangerous. It rises high in the air and can be carried by winds for hundreds of miles before falling to the ground. You can protect yourself and your family. And later on, we will show you what steps to take. It may be a basic overview, but it's a very harrowing opener. This video essentially serves as the beginner's guide to a nuclear attack. And even though it may just be going through the motions of explaining a blast and the fallout that occurs, but for this and for all the videos today, you really have to put yourself in the mindset of being in the 70s and learning most of this for the first time. Imagine being a child who is aware of the threat of nuclear war and then seeing this to learn of the devastation that can answer. Next up, we have all the tips on picking your fallout room and your inner refuge. If you have taken the advice we've been giving you recently, you will by now have chosen your fallout room 
and gathered your materials for an inner refuge. The time has now come to make everything ready for you and your family in case an air attack happens. This does not mean that war is bound to come, but there is a risk of this, and we must all be prepared for it. So, don't waste time. Start now. To help you, we will remind you once again about choosing a fallout room and an inner refuge. First, choosing a fallout room. That should be a room in your house which will give you the best possible protection from fallout. A room that is farthest from the outside walls and the roof, or one with the smallest amount of outside wall is safest. Whatever room you choose, remember that the further you can get away from radioactive dust in or around your home, the safer you will be. So in a house, the safest place is the ground floor or basement. In a block of flats, do not shelter in the top two floors if the block is five floors high or more. Go to the lower floors, ground floor or basement. The central corridors will give good protection. If you live in a bungalow or similar one-story home, it will not give you much protection. If you cannot make alternative arrangements, choose the safest place, which is a space farthest from the roof and outside walls. And now a reminder about your inner refuge. We have told you that your fallout room should be the safest place in your home. Even this is sometimes not safe enough, however, particularly for the first two days and nights after an attack when the danger from radiation could be critical. So you need, inside your fallout room, an inner refuge. A fortified area to give you greater protection during the worst of the attack. The inner refuge should be thickly lined with dense materials to resist radiation, away from outside walls if possible. Now for its construction. Make a lean-to with wood resting against an inside wall. Use boards or doors taken from their hinges. Stop them slipping down the wall by nailing a strip of wood to the floor like this. Cover them with dense material and fix some rope around it so that it won't slip. Partly close the open ends, leaving an easy way in and out of your refuge like this. Another good place for a refuge is a cupboard under the stairs. Reinforce the stairs and the side like this. If the stairs are on an outside wall, stack up containers of earth or sand to make the wall thicker to resist radiation. If you've got tables large enough to give you and your family sufficient shelter, use them. Make the side solid with heavy furniture or boxes of books or sand. Reinforce the top with strong boards or doors and cover them with dense materials. More details are given in the booklet Protect and Survive. If you haven't got one yet, get one from the post office now. And start right away making your home and your family as safe as possible from nuclear attack. Start now on your fallout room and inner refuge. Thicken the floor above your fallout room. Start blocking windows, doors, halls, passages. Thicken the outside wall if your fallout room is against it. All these things can save your life. Start now. <laughs> Well that certainly was a long video, wasn't it? This one gives me that scary feeling, but it also confuses me somewhat. I get what he's saying about trying to make your fallout room somewhere away from outside walls and all this sort of stuff, but hasn't he failed to mention that if your house is within 5 miles of the blast, that it could be destroyed? A fact that this narrator mentioned in the first clip even? Also, I get the idea of stacking and all sorts of heavy objects against the walls, against staircases, and even against your inner refuges, which, according to this, is based on three doors being propped up against a wall. 
but for a family of four that is going to be hideously cramped. But my issue again with this idea is should the structure of the house be compromised, you're essentially done. It doesn't matter how many heavy bags you have, assuming you have as many as this video suggests, you would be down and out. It does make me wonder whether the people making this knew that some of these ideas are ever so slightly flawed concepts, or if they were being dead serious that these techniques could actually save lives in the event of a nuclear attack. Oh, and another thing to take away is, if you live on fifth floor or higher stories in flat complexes and you can't find alternative accommodation, you're pretty much dead. Same for bungalow owners, you've got no chance either. But now moving on, let's have a look at what to do after the warning bells have sounded. A warning may come quite unexpectedly. We will now tell you what to do if a warning sounds when you are at home. And then we will explain what to do if you are out of doors. First, if you are at home. If attack is imminent, you will hear the attack sound like this. So take cover at once. Send your young children to the fallout room, then go quickly and turn off the gas and the electricity at the mains. Close down stoves. Damp down fires. Shut windows. And draw curtains. Then go to your fallout room and stay there. If the fallout warning sounds are heard, they will be like these. You should now move yourself and your family to the safest area in your fallout room. That is, you should get inside your inner refuge and stay there. After two days, the danger from fallout will get less, but don't take any risks by contact with it. The longer you stay in your refuge, the better it will be for you. Listen to your radio. Stay where you are and keep listening to your radio. Now, this is what you should do if you are out of doors when the warning sounds. Take cover at once when you hear the attack sound. If you cannot reach home in 10 minutes, take cover in the nearest building. If there is no building nearby, try to find some solid cover. If there is no solid cover, lie flat in a ditch or a hole and cover your head, face and hands as fast as you can with some of your clothes. If you hear the fallout warning, seek the nearest and best cover as quickly as you can. But before entering the building or cover, brush or shake off any fallout dust you may have picked up and get rid of it. Change your outer clothing if you can. Stay under cover. When the all clear sounds, like this, It means that you are safe from attack or fallout for the time being and that you can go out again. But keep listening for further warnings or to your radio for further advice. Okay, well I have one conclusive thing to say here. I don't care who you are, what your qualifications are or what you tell me, but as far as I'm concerned, if you're outside of a building and you're taking actions like lying down in a ditch or hiding underneath a bridge, 
I'm sorry, but you're dead. Even if the blast doesn't get you, the fallout certainly will. I just can't believe people making these as safety videos suggest that if there are no buildings, you just lie down flat on your face. I mean, come on. Now, for stuff in the home, it's all more logical. Switch off your gas, your electric, etc. But you gotta hope that the bomb is at least a few minutes away after that siren goes off. All the narrator implies is that an attack is on the way if the siren goes. He doesn't even state how long you have, roughly. For all you know, it could be anything from 10 minutes to 10 seconds. That in itself is a horrifying prospect. Also, it may just be me, but I don't think the sounds that represent a fallout are loud enough. Imagine all the chaos and panic of a nuclear attack. How the hell will you hear three gongs? But hey, if you think hearing sounds within your fallout room is the worst of your worries, you are sorely mistaken. For now, we shall take a look at what we should do regarding water and food. After an attack, you may have to stay in your home for about 14 days. So make sure to store plenty of water and food for your family. Water is more essential to life than food. You can live for a long time with a little food if you have enough water or liquids to drink. How much is enough? Well, each person should drink about two pints a day. So, for 14 days, three and a half gallons is enough for one person. But you should double this amount if you can. Then there will be some to spare for washing your face and hands. Keep drinking water in your fallout room. Store it in plastic containers with a screw top or in bottles or jars covered to keep out dirt. Store the rest in kettles and saucepans and in basins and the bathtub. Try to keep some tins of fruit juice as well. Now food. Stock enough for everybody for 14 days. You may not be able to cook anything hot, so buy foods you can eat cold and that will not go bad. Buy food well wrapped or in tins. And by the way, don't forget your tin opener and bottle opener. You will do best to buy lots of different kinds of foods if you can, so that you won't get bored with too much of the same thing. Stock up with meats, vegetables, fruit, tinned or powdered milk, and special foods for babies or invalids. You will also need some sweet things, like sugar or jam, and biscuits. Keep the food in a cool, dry place until you have to take it to your fallout room. Foods that will go bad quickly should be the first to be eaten. Try to ration everything so that it will last out. Well, I hope you all have a really large fallout room. Honestly, the amount of stuff this is asking you to prepare, whilst I understand it is quite frankly gonna be ridiculous if, say, the fallout room is the size of a box. Because not only is a lot of the space gonna be used for your inner refuge, but then you have to have shelves or some sort of space for this stuff. And 3.5 gallons of water for one person is all well and good, but for a family of four, that's 14 gallons you have to store in some kind of container, and then apparently double it if you want to wash things with water. I mean, who had this sort of space in a family house of four in the 1970s? It's the same with the food. I mean, I understand having a variety is good considering you'll be spending up to two weeks essentially eating from a tin, which can be seen as a fate worse than death itself, but you can't forget the biscuits. Just because even in a nuclear attack, we still have to prove somehow that we are quintessentially British people. So even though the demands made on people back then were a bit much, and even then, the narrator fails to mention the possibility of what happens if after two weeks it's not safe to leave the house. Suppose you just have to starve. Suppose he can't be too blunt now, can he? But I know what he can tell us about. Fire safety.
A nuclear explosion produces intense heat. This can get through unprotected windows and set fire to things in your home. But there are steps you can take now to cut down the risk. First, whiten your windows with white paint to reflect some of the heat away. This will cut down the risk of these fires. Then get rid of junk lying about in your attics and upper floors, especially old papers and magazines which can catch fire easily. The heat from the bomb strikes at attics and upper floors most easily, and fires there are usually the hardest to put out, so pay particular attention to these places. In other parts of the building, clear away papers and magazines. Then net curtains from windows. And any old rubbish inside or outside your home which is likely to catch fire easily. Small fires can be put out easily if they are tackled at once. If they are left, they spread fast and soon get out of control. The fire brigade may not be able to reach you and you will have to protect yourself without any help. So prepare now. If you have a fire extinguisher, keep it handy. Or a garden hose could be very useful. Keep buckets of sand and water ready on each floor. Now all of this is good and just, but I have just one question. This idea of painting over your windows, cleaning out your attic, getting rid of any random bit of rubbish, etc. Are you supposed to do all this before the threat of attack? Or are they really expecting you to do all of this in the time between an alarm sounding and the bomb dropping? If it's the latter and you commit to doing all of this, consider yourself wiped off the face of this earth. I'm leaning more towards that outcome because why would anyone paint over their windows like this just in regular life? It's daft. But to do all these things between the warning sirens and the eventual blast, that's a huge, if not impossible, ask for most families. But then it does clash badly with the risk of fire, which is a very real risk, I suppose. So despite what this video is telling you, you have two choices. Either you hear that siren and you head straight for that fallout room and just risk fire happening, or you do all of these things and hope to god that the bomb doesn't drop, in time, but still have a high chance of being blown to bits regardless. I know which one i choose. But now we shall look at our final Protect and Survive video for today, and it's probably covering the most serious and horrible topic of all. Casualties. After an attack is over, and the all clear has been sounded, Arrangements will be made as soon as possible to treat any people who are ill or injured. Listen to your radio. Details will be given about what to do, when to do it, and how. If anyone dies while you are kept in your fallout room, move the body to another room in the house. Label the body with name and address, and cover it as tightly as possible in polythene, paper, sheets or blankets. Tie a second card to the covering. The radio will advise you what to do about taking the body away for burial. If, however, you have had a body in the house for more than five days, and if it is safe to go outside, then you should bury the body for the time being in a trench or cover it with earth and mark the spot of the burial. I admired this one in a lot of ways that it asks so much of its audience. The prospect of someone close to you dying is horrible enough, but imagine being told that should they die in the fallout room, that you'll have to cover them up, place them outside for potentially days on end, and then for a short time, even if it's possible, to bury them on your front porch. I mean, thank goodness that so far we have never had to endure a nuclear attack, but if we did, 
I honestly think this video and its actions would have the biggest impact of them all. Nuclear attacks are scary, but I think if you're with people you love, it becomes a little easier to handle. But to have to dispose of said loved ones in such a crude and makeshift manner would shatter the hearts, and I'm sure even the resolves, of millions of people. Overall, what do I think of Protect and Survive? Well, considering that in the 1970s the idea and threat of a nuclear attack was still very much a real possibility, I can excuse some of the laughable and downright ridiculousness of some of the things the British public were expected to do in preparation, but even though so far in the 21st century the whole world hasn't yet used any nuclear weapons for warlike intent, it could be argued that Protect and Survive's impact and value is vastly less meaningful than it was some 45 years ago, given to the advancements in nuclear technology but also based on what we know of its effects. However, some of these videos, particularly the casualties one, I think still has a lot of significant weight to it. To think that should we ever have to endure some sort of nuclear attack, that this video will still probably bear the same implications as it did all those years ago. Now just before we close off, I want to say I first learned about Protect and Survive from a great video done by Ben at the Oddity Archive. He makes some great content on old technology and film, so if you're into that sort of stuff like I am, then please check him out. And with that, we have come to the end of Video Scaries. I hope you enjoyed basking in the nostalgic clips that once upon a time made us cower or shriek with terror. So what to take away from today? I think it's the following. You are better off in your own home. Stay there. Thank you for watching. We hope you like, subscribe and share the video around. And we hope that you join us next time. The star that